Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Courage Conversation Show. I'm your host, Ashley Easter. I'm the founder and executive director of Courage 365, and we have a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be interviewing our board member, Lyria Forsyth. She's been on the board since the very beginning, and even before we had a board, Lyria has been involved with Courage and participating by hosting Courage Conversation mini events in her town. She has uh, spoken at one of our leadership events and she really adds so much from both a survivor ex- uh, experience to our board, but also from really just an organizational standpoint. She's an amazing person. And we're actually going to be having a conversation today about one of her newest interests, which is health and exercise coaching. She's actually gotten some trainings and certifications recently, and she has a particular soft spot in her heart for helping survivors who maybe struggle with some of these areas around health and physical activeness. So that's where we're going to focus our conversation. In just a minute, I'm going to bring Lyria onto the screen, but before that, let's pause for these messages. Talk about it. I was told not to talk about it. So I'm here to talk about it. Because I can't stay quiet. I was able to break my silence. Because of those who refuse to stay quiet. I am a businesswoman. Activist. Survivor. 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 Anxiousness can strike at any time while driving a car, in the middle of the night, when giving a work presentation or in a crowded place. Introducing CalmeGo, a smart calming device that learns your personal breathing patterns and adapts to you for immediate relief in just three minutes. It quiets your senses through breathing regulation, multi-sensory stimulation, and calming scents. Don't stress another moment. Click the Learn More button and start using CalmeGo today. Everyone, welcome back to Courage Conversations. Lyria is here with us today. Hey, Lyria, thanks so much for being on the show. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. I think last time we talked about um, safety and discussing difficult topics with children around sexual abuse, sexual safety, and consent. And if anybody has not listened to that yet, I would encourage everybody tuning in to go back and watch that because that was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but while we were kind of in the gear of like talking about safety before, you've now like opened up this whole new area of your life where you're doing this health and fitness coaching. And mm-hmm. it's really now focused on getting your body healthy, but also you have this place in your heart for survivors. And so I guess my first question for you is how is physical movement and exercise, um, why is it important for survivors and why is it so important to you? Well, I started actually working out for myself probably about a dec over a decade ago now. Um, and, uh, I think for me, which I'm sure a lot of survivors can relate to, it was um, initially it was a form of punishment, uh, a feeling of not being content with my body, not like constantly criticizing it, constantly feeling like it wasn't meeting up to standards. Um, And I I initially got into um, exercise because I needed to fulfill something and had to take back control um, for a piece of me that you know, had been like that control had been removed from certain Mm -hmm. situations in my life. Um, again, that was 10 years ago. I've gone through extensive trauma counseling at this point. And yeah, about a year ago, um, I'd been doing it for so long that my husband's like, you know, it's time, it's time that you actually do something. Um, I was coaching survivors just on like them and helping them go through their, their trauma, uh, trauma counseling, um, and, uh, having this is a uh, much more life-giving, it's a, a lighter topic, but still can help that community. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it. But in that process, I've realized like how important fitness has been for me and how important it can be for other survivors in their healing journey. 
Um, a lot of it has to take place after or at least during um, trauma counseling. It's not a heal all. It's not going to fix all of your problems. It's not going to release a lot of emotions that need to be dealt with, but it certainly can be a tool. Like we have other tools to utilize um, in our journey. And I think it's important because, um, again, going back to that feeling of a lack of control and having our bodies being used in um, horrific ways and being violated in horrific ways, um, when we take back control in this way and not just control what we eat, control how we move, but actually show our bodies love that they weren't shown during that trauma, mm -hmm. um, I think those pieces come together and they just click in a way that other things don't necessarily do. Um, so I find that fitness and I find that in nutrition, um, they all of those pieces kind of support the the counseling that we do, that that healing work that we do through counseling. Um, when we exercise, when we eat healthy, it actually releases endorphins, which I'm sure many people have heard, which are the, the happy hormones. Um, and they just, there's an overall sense of feeling good, feeling, um, accomplished, feeling relief, anxiety, and stress relief when we exercise. Um, and when we fuel our bodies with healthy foods, it, again, they all work together to create a place where we can actually be satisfied and content with this body that we've been given. Um, so that's why I find it important for me, why I, you know, when I talk to other survivors, it's something that they want to work on to just have that feeling of, oh, I, I can actually love my body again. Like it's not this horrible thing that is always used against me. So that's why. Yeah. It sounds like using physical exercise and movement and even nutrition is like an embodiment tool in practice. And we've mm -hmm. had other episodes about embodiment and like listening to our bodies. And this seems like a really practical way to get in tune with our bodies and pay attention. But something I want to talk about, and I'm going to get a little bit vulnerable here because I fit into one of these categories. Um, I want to ask you about some of the triggers that may come up for survivors mm -hmm. around um, moving their body around exercise, those types of things. There's two types of people that I tend to see. And I think when we've had a conversation, you've mentioned this before, but I knew a survivor friend who went to the gym like it was their job and it wasn't their job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they seemed to work out to a point where it seemed like it became this obsession in their life it was all they could think about, all they could talk about. It seemed like it overtook them completely going to the gym. And so I've seen that. And I feel like anytime you have kind of a a thing in your life that's like overtaking, overshadowing everything else, mm -hmm. that's probably not the healthiest path. But sure. it seemed like a trigger issue there. But then on the opposite side, I know for myself, I have some trauma around working out and exercising. And mm -hmm. so I'll go through seasons of time where I'll move my body. I'll do some meditative dance. I might use the elliptical, but then I'll mm -hmm. go maybe eight months and I won't move my body hardly mm -hmm. at all. And I also know that that doesn't feel good. There's stagnant mm -hmm. energy in my body. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could kind of talk about some of those um, triggers that you see popping up, particularly mm -hmm. for survivors around working out and kind of address that a little bit? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, certainly there's the, the, the extremes so what you just said. Um, I think the, the first example that you gave is more in line with that punishment, that idea of um, trying to regain control that was taken from you. A lot of the same way as you see eating disorders, um, where it is just, it's this need to, to have control because nobody else can have a say in what you put in your mouth. Nobody else is, they're not supposed to tell you how much you can work out. Like, you know, um, so I think a lot of times that is, it's this mental need and obsession to, um, strive for something because it was lost before. Mm. Um, and I, and like you said, I mean, that's not healthy at all. I mean, it's such a, an obsession and anything is not healthy, but certainly um, beating up your body, trying to prove something, trying to take back something that was taken from you. That's 
um, that's not healing anything. That is, you know, continue, perpetuating um, the unhealth in your life. Uh, the the reverse, having triggers around exercise. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to hear more and more stories of people who, um, women specifically, who have trauma around exercise. And the, the common denominator that I keep hearing is... Um, the adrenaline rush that you get from exercising. So the elevated heart rate, the Mm -hmm. um, heavy breathing, the, um, yeah, the the, the adrenaline, Mm -hmm. all of it um, can be very reminiscent of trauma, depending on Mm -hmm. what trauma you experienced. And um, if you're not prepared for it, if you're not used for it, if you haven't practiced it, it can be very, very triggering. Um, For me, I get very overwhelmed by busy gyms. So for the majority of my time and for the last 10 years, I've been working at home because the idea of walking into a gym um, is, uh, yeah, it it can shut me down pretty quickly. It's the loud music. It's the people everywhere. It's the big bulky guys, um, which is not like that is very much a stereotype. There are plenty of women that go to the gym now and are completely safe. But in my mind, that is something that I had a bad experience going to a gym. And so now I, I really struggle to walk into one now. Um, so I would say those are pretty common things that, that people deal with around exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not things that you can't move past, but like everything else, it takes practice. It takes, um, being aware of your triggers, uh, learning to know what the lines are for yourself and what is comfortable for you. And if you even want to push those boundaries. So, um, you know, you said that you were vulnerable and, and opened up a little bit about your struggle. Um, you know, if it, if it's something that it's an elevated heart rate, so maybe you don't exercise in a way that elevates your heart rate. Um, you know, for me, my struggle is going to a packed gym with the loud music and the people everywhere and feeling claustrophobic by the the machines and, you know, the clients and all of that stuff. Um, so I choose to avoid that and I find other avenues to work out. Um, you know, when it comes to punishing your body, I think that uh, again, I mean, we all we all are going to get triggered by different things. We're all going to um, walk through our healing process in different ways. Um, certainly, you know, we could all go to counseling for the rest of our lives. <laughs> I could always use more counseling. Um, <laughs> but I think the idea is not to not to be there anymore, not to have to constantly um, meet a counselor, but to find ways to manage the balance um, and finding healthy finding ways to treat our our body with love the way it, it deserves to be um, by taking care of it without um, these extreme all or nothing situations. Mm. So does that answer your question? It does. It really does. And I think even you talking about the environment of a gym, um, that makes a lot of sense. Because like you said, Mm. there are plenty of women who go to the gym. There's some nice guys that go to the gym. My husband goes to the gym and he's a nice guy and he's not one of those who who makes all kinds of noise and makes people uncomfortable. So I know that there are people that don't fit that stereotype. Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking a couple months ago, I went, we had uh, a gym near our house and they had a certain price, but they were like a chain. And if we got a Mm -hmm. membership from a gym a couple miles down the road, you could go to this gym, but it was like a different price. And so anyway, Mm -hmm. went into this gym to get this membership. And I kid you not, the guy that walks up, he looks like the Hulk. I mean, I never, I mean, his neck was probably the size of my waist Mm -hmm. and I'm talking about the hip part, not like the the smaller part that goes in. Like it was probably the size of my (laughs) hips, his neck. And he was like, um, there was also like a tanning booth in there. So he's like completely Mm -hmm. spray tanned. And I was just like, he was really gruff and kind of rude. And I was just like, I would never feel safe coming to this Mm -hmm. one. I'm glad I'm, you know, getting the deal so I can go the one closer to the house. But I think, I think this just isn't talked about. So whether it mm-hmm. is going to the gym to punish yourself, whether it is the gym being there as like um, this kind of overwhelming scene or just mm-hmm. completely shutting down and not wanting to move your body at all, I, I think that's something a lot of people don't talk about. And so mm-hmm. we feel shame either way. Yep. Um, we feel shame because oh, you're always at the gym or we feel shame because 
do you even work out? You know, and, and so right. there's that piece. And I, I don't mm-hmm. think that a lot of people talk about it, but it makes so much sense when you connect it to some of the elevated states that we get in when we're in a traumatic situation and mm-hmm. just the other triggers. So thank you for kind of clearing that up and mm-hmm. explaining it. Um, and then I think what even compounds these triggers is there's other like myths and unhealthy ideologies around exercise and movement mm-hmm. set out by like the media and society. Sure. Could you maybe even talk to that a little bit? Sure. Well, I mean, certainly there's a ton of myths around it. There's the whole all or nothing mentality, where it's if you're not working out four or five times a week and resistant training and doing all like this heavy cardio or hit now and all of that stuff that um, you're not doing it right. Well, that's a load of nonsense. Um, you know, when it comes to nutrition, there's all the fad diets, there's, you know, keto and paleo, and you have to be vegan and you have to, you know, all these eliminations, no sugar. And there's nothing innately wrong with any of those things, um, except for the fact that most of them are unsustainable long term, unless you have a medical reason to eliminate mm-hmm. something. Um, we are designed to have all of it because just about everything has some nutritional value to it. It's on a, you know, different scales, but um, those extreme mentalities that are put in our heads uh, make it really difficult, first of all, to know what truth is and for anybody to sign up for it because none of it sounds great. Um, The whole body comparison thing, um, you had touched on that briefly about body shaming and things like that. I mean, as soon as you jump on social media, it's it can quickly spiral out of control, which is why I think people have a bad taste in their mouth as far as exercise goes and um, assuming that anyone who exercises needs to be this jacked up person. Um, that's just, it's just not, it's not true. It's not necessary mm-hmm. to be healthy. It's not necessary to move your bodies like that. That doesn't have to be everyone's goals. One of the things that I talk about with my clients when I do a consultation is um, my goal for them is not to lose weight unless it's their goal. Like that's not, that can't be the only thing. And if their goal is to lose weight, I need a couple other things from them. Like you need to add something that has nothing to do with your weight when Mm -hmm. it comes to exercise and nutrition, because um, our weight is going to fluctuate. Even if you're eating completely on point and you exercise a four or five times a week, our weight fluctuates based on our carbs, based on our salt intake, based on how late we eat the night before. Hormones. Um, right. All of those things. Absolutely. So we jump on the scale and all of a sudden we equate our worth and our value to that number on the scale. Um, and I'm sure, you know, it can very quickly determine how your day goes. At least it is for me. Like I stopped jumping on the scale every day, um, because I was finding that it was impacting how I chose to do that day. And that's Mm. ridiculous. That's not living my life. That's allowing a number to control my life. Um, and so it was just one more thing that had an healthy, an unhealthy impact on me. So one of the myths is, you know, that, It has to be, you have to be on point all the time. Right. Um, And that's, again, it's not true. Um, Most people can see some kind of progress in whatever goal that is, whether that is uh, strength gaining, whether it is weight loss, whether it is is, um, that they want to be able to do more push-ups, you know, whatever it is, they want to be able to run two miles in one setting or in one session. Um, Most people can see progress if they're consistent 80% 80% of the time. It's not a hundred percent of the time. It's 80, which is like a pretty decent, normal amount <laughs> to yeah. do anything. It's yeah. completely reasonable. Um, but if you go on social media, there is this idea that, um, if you're not giving it your all, then you're not doing it well enough. Um, and I think that shuts people down and it scares even just the general public away from adding anything healthy into their daily routine. Um, but for survivors, where again, you know, when our baseline is we didn't have control, and now we want all of this control, um, it can it, it can quickly spiral from something that should be very good and uplifting and mentally healthy. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm-hmm. Me- mental health, <laughs> health, 
healthy for our mental state, that's what I meant to say, <laughs> um, into something that, again, just adds to the trauma and adds, reinforces bad behaviors, bad thought processes, um, things like that. Right. And I think when when people look on social media, because I think that's where a lot of the pressure comes from. I think a lot of pressure comes from families. Oftentimes, too, there can be like a history of um, misogynist beliefs about what a woman should or shouldn't look like, what a woman can or cannot do. And that can go either way. Like some families are like, you know, women shouldn't work out and build muscle because that's not feminine. Or, you know, if you don't weigh a certain weight, then you're not, you know, there, there can be a lot of of trauma in families, but when you step to to social media, we see it really amplified. And something that has really helped me is I follow a lot of influencers. I follow a lot of different accounts, mm-hmm. and two accounts that are my favorite are ones that actually show paparazzi pictures of celebrities compared mm-hmm. to their um, Instagram photos. And it's mm-hmm. not coming from a shaming place because hey. I put a little filter on my pictures too. I'm not going to lie about that. If I, if I have a breakout of acne, I'm going to put a filter on. Okay, I've read that. But um, when you see these two comparisons of like these mm-hmm. candid photos versus like the curated photos, you mm-hmm. begin to realize that, okay, they might be promoting this diet or this exercise routine or saying if you're consistent, you can get this when actually that's Photoshop or mm-hmm. I I listened to this um, YouTube channel where it was talking about how much money celebrities often spend on plastic surgery and alterations to Mm -hmm. their body. And no shade or shame if somebody wants to get body alterations. I'm not here to tell you not to do that. But just know that to get that body, they didn't just go to the gym and work out. Sure. They paid $300,000 for that. Right. And right. if you want to get those results, you're probably going to have to pay $300,000 for that. Right. Um, well, and then also, they have a personal uh, nutritionist. Exactly. They have a personal coach. They have people walking around like feeding them every, exactly. exactly what they need to be eating. Yes. That's just not, it's not realistic. Yeah. So I think that can be another thing that comes up for survivors too with yep. this perfectionism is like, okay, well, I finally want to do this. I have these goals to be stronger, to look a certain way, to do whatever. And then mm-hmm. they, do those things and they hit reasonable goals, but then they're comparing themselves to something that isn't using those same tools to get a result. They're using something right. um, more extreme and unattainable to most exactly. people. Right. And I, I just, um, I don't know. I think it's really important to know. And again, this isn't a shaming thing. Like, Hey, sure. if somebody wants to get a lift and a tuck, I'm not going to tell them no. Yeah. Um, but don't, you know, let's not compare ourselves to people who paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a look right? when we're expecting to be able to get that look from just like walking on the treadmill or lifting some weights. Right. That's that's just not real. And those looks (laughs) like the the big bodybuilders, they've spent years doing this. Right. Whenever I see things like, oh, you know, lose, you know, 50 pounds in three months or, you know, gain five pounds of muscles and, you know, the next two months, that's a load of crap. (laughs) There is no (laughs) physical way to do that. I actually just listened to a podcast over the summer that was talking about if a man, so a man can build muscle way faster than a woman Mm -hmm. can just because of how they're wired. Um, A man at the prime of his time, so mid twenties, if he were to work out perfectly for an entire year and eat perfect nutrition for an entire year, no slips, no nothing, like no deviations for an entire year, at the most he could gain six pounds of muscle. Wow. That's at the prime of his life. So these guys that are walking around completely jacked, women who are like toned and absolutely the hourglass figure and all of that stuff, doesn't happen in three months. Um, it happens over years. It's a lifestyle that they have chosen. It's something that they practice consistently, 80% of the time when I say consistently, mm-hmm. for years on end. So anytime, you know, we see these ads for the magic diet pill or the supplements that will help you lose weight or suppress your, your appetite, none of them are actually healthy, sustainable ways to reach that goal. And they're not going to give it to you in 90 days. It's just not going to happen. Um, so we, uh, society and the media puts the stuff in our heads mm-hmm. and then we end up comparing ourselves to that. And when we fail, which we will, because it's not real. 
it just then adds on to our body shame and how our bodies aren't good enough and how they're failing us again. And, you know, all of those spirals that, that, um, we take, it just compounds all of that. Um, it's such a dangerous combination of things that instead of just telling someone, just eat more vegetables, drink more water and take a walk a couple times a week and you'll be golden. Um, we, we put all of these ridiculous expectations and requirements on it and it's just, it overcomplicates it and it actually, um, removes a lot of the, the joy and the health from getting healthy, if that makes sense. Right. So if the goal is not to lose weight, if the goal Mm -hmm. is not to look like these curated people online, if the goal is to be healthy for ourselves, Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the impacts that we can look for as positive markers, particularly around mental health when um, we're discussing working on our physical health? What are, what are some of the mental health benefits? Oh my gosh, there's so many. It's, um, just working out just one time. If you work out, you immediately feel a lift in your mood. And again, it's the endorphins and there's a whole bunch of chemical things, which I'm not going to get into because honestly, like scientific stuff is a little bit much for a lot of people. Um, but just knowing that working out once can give a lift in mood. Um, when the more consistently you do, you add any form of exercise and I'm not talking like, again, I'm not talking extreme hits. I'm not talking even necessarily resistance training, just walk. Let's just say you take a consistent half hour walk three or four times a week. You will start to see um, your mood consistently uh, be better. You will find yourself more joyful overall. Mm -hmm. Anxiety starts to decrease. Uh, We begin to sleep better because we are moving our body in a very gentle way. It actually creates a pattern where we are naturally tired by the time we get to bed. Um, when we start adding other things, you start adding the nutrition part to it, then our digestion starts to kick in. Um, and again, like, I don't know about you, but when I'm not digesting things properly and when I feel uncomfortable, that makes an overall sense of just feeling gross. So your life could be going great, but if your body feels gross, it, it, it takes away from your mental health. Um, when we, if you are walking and you walk outside, being outside, being outdoors, It gives a lift to our mental health. Um, There's all of these very gentle things that um, occur over time that are not like, it's not going to be this mile marker where like, oh, I just dropped two inches. It's going to be this moment of like, oh my gosh, I've been sleeping really well for three weeks. So Lyria, after we've talked about all this, we talked about some of the triggers that could come up, some of the unrealistic expectations. And I think now we have a grasp that Goals for our movement, our exercise, really are around feeling good. They're around boosting our mental health. What are some simple exercises that you would maybe recommend to our community? Um, things that that you can share from your experience as a fitness coach. Um, well, number one, walking. Absolutely, I'm just taking a 30 minute walk a couple times a week is honestly enough. Um, there's a reason why they, you'll hear, you know, hit 10,000 steps in a day. It's because that is a really great goal overall, and it's not that hard to hit. But I would say if you can do nothing else, take a walk outside a couple times a week. For other things, um, resistance training is great if you want to build muscle. And that was kind of the direction I decided to go because I wanted that feeling of, of strength. Um, and that actually, that really very much gives it to you. Any kind of um, kickboxing or martial arts is really great if you're struggling with anger or anxiety. Um, I actually just read an article about how it it can actually help recreate the trauma, but also then allow you to finish the experience of the trauma. So when we are assaulted, um, there's that feeling of powerless, but when you are, do something like kickboxing or Muay Thai or something like that, where you're kicking and punching, you actually feel that anxiety. You feel that elevation of your heart rate and all of that, but you actually get to finish it out because you get to beat up your <laughs> assailant. So there can be connection and, and a little bit of healing there, depending on what your, your trauma is. Um, yoga is great for um, practicing mindfulness, being very present in your body. 
So if you are somebody who dis disassociates from your body, um, that can be a great tool to use. And again, like it's still building strength. You're still learning flexibility, but it, it practices that breathing that sometimes we um, forget how to do when we get scared or anxiety goes up. Um, Pilates are great if you are, um, actually that's really great for being aware of your body. Um, good for breathing too, but like it, it, it practices your entire awareness of, you know, where your feet are, where your hands are, where, um, you get a sense of keeping yourself in touch with what your body is doing and feeling at any moment. Um, running is great. If you like cardio, I know a lot of people don't like cardio, but running is great again, practicing breathing, but it also, that's great for anxiety relief. It's good for stress relief. It's, um, really great for clarity of mind, kind of it. There's something about running, which I don't normally enjoy, but I will use from time to time um, just to like kind of get my head out of my own, like my own way, really. Um, honestly, what it comes down to is, is what brings you joy. I mean, at the end of the day, no matter what, we can recommend a thousand different workouts. Like, you know, you can go on YouTube, you can go on Instagram and find all these different workouts to do. But if it doesn't bring you joy, um, then you're not going to do it you're going to resent it even more and it's going to be useless for you. So what, what we need to do is find something that um, relieves all of that tension from us and, and brings peace to us, even if it is kickboxing, which seems counterproductive, but um, we need to find things that bring us joy and then just try and slowly integrate it into our life, whatever that looks like. There is no right or wrong way to do it. It just, However, you can get your body moving in a way that shows love to yourself and shows your body care and treats it like it's precious the way it always deserved to be. That's what you need to do. It's almost like kind of what I'm hearing from you is if somebody were to work with you as like a fitness coach, that you almost mm -hmm. give them a prescription of what workout is good for them based on what kind of trauma triggers or trauma situations and things that they Yeah, want. I mean we absolutely that's something that we could do, but um I really encourage my clients to find a thing that they like. Um yeah. and then work around it and and work to have that thing. So if like somebody likes tennis, it's not necessarily going to build muscle, but we might be able to incorporate tennis movements into building muscle and kind of right. get it to coordinate um with one another. But yeah, it um, I feel like um so many times coaches forget and just trauma informed coaches aside like just regular coaches forget that it's about the client that it's mm -hmm. about the person wanting to better themselves in some way and they make it about themselves and they make it about like their knowledge and how they're going to impose it on this person um and that is not not, not how I do things at all um I have a little well, like you said I mean I have a soft spot for survivors I have a soft spot for people and just loving them where they are in their journey and um, finding ways to make them feel safe, making them feel empowered, helping them achieve whatever it is that gives them peace in their life. And so, yeah, you know, we, there are different, different techniques that you can use in that. Um, but really it always just comes back to what is that person? What can that person do to make them feel more peace and joy in their life? Mm, that's so important. I love how it is focused on the client versus focused mm -hmm. on the coach's ego or, um, yeah. you know, being able to say, oh, I accomplished this, that, and the other for my clients. No, it's like, what, right. what does your client need and how can this best bring joy and health and goodness into their life? <laughs> yep really, really powerful. Well, yeah. I know I've asked you this question before, um, but it's one we ask at the end of every show. And I'm wondering, what is one of the best pieces of advice that you've ever received? Um, and I know mm -hmm. you've received so much good advice. So whatever comes to mind right now, we'd love to hear it. The best piece of advice in anything, not fitness or nutrition related, like something, anything? Whatever comes to mind. Um, Honestly, it, it it's to find your sanctuary. 
Um, that is something that my husband and I have used repeatedly over the course of our marriage and raising our kids. And like when we were choosing our home, when we were choosing our jobs, it was, is this thing going to bring us peace or is it going to um, feel like a burden? Is it something that we will run towards or try and avoid? Um, I think, I think it's so important for people to have a, a sanctuary, a safe place that they can just rest. Um, and there's no implied anything. There's no imposed anything on them. It's just, you just get to be you, uh, Mm -hmm. whatever that looks like. And so, yeah, I think that was, I don't even, I couldn't even tell you who gave us that advice. Um, but it was one that we have taken and, and tried to apply to every area of our life is just find the sanctuary. Mm, that's so good. So, so good. And I know after hearing all of this and learning about um, your work, people are going to want to follow you. And mm-hmm. um, I don't even think I knew about this until a couple of weeks ago, but I started following your other Instagram account where it's all your fitness mm-hmm. stuff. So like, it's, it's really good. You've got a lot of reels and a lot of, you know, great content for people to interact with. So tell people where they can find you. Sure. So I'm on Instagram right now. It's fuelfitness.coach is um, my name on there. It's also on Facebook, um, but I haven't quite gotten that one to be the page. So I want to be, so I'm really focused on Instagram now. I just feel like it's fast and fun. Um, and then once you're on my Instagram uh, page, my homepage, you can see the link to schedule a consultation. If anyone is interested in finding out more about trauma informed fitness coaching, that's the way to do it. Or they can just DM me. Okay. Okay. And you take clients wherever they don't have to be in person. Yep. Clients, right? Okay. Yeah. So I take all clients. Um, but again, my love is women who are survivors. Um, I have a whole, program just set up for um for them and that is like I have the nutrition and fitness which anyone I have plenty of different clients there but as far as trauma survivors um we deal way more with um the mental health aspect of it and using some other techniques like journaling um when you kind of get triggered by things stuff like that um to incorporate more of the mental health aspect to the physical health aspect that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lyria. I know people are going to want to follow you for sure. I appreciate you sharing your Thanks. wisdom with us today. Thanks so much, Ashley, for having me again. Absolutely. And everyone, I know you're also going to want to follow us on social media. If you haven't already, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. And um, you can find us there. We've got a couple of exciting things coming up. And I just want to take a moment to plug these. So first of all, this is our last episode of season three for the Courage Conversation Show. I know, I know, I can't believe it. This is our third season and we're already at the end of it. We'll be starting Courage Conversation Show again in uh, the new year. But in the meantime, starting October 1st through the 30th, we have an online free event called the 30 Days of Courage. And the 30 Days of Courage is packed full of amazing speakers who are going to be there sharing not only their stories, but how to move forward after you've experienced abuse. We've got some epic speakers. We've got Chrissy Stroop, who's been on the show before. Uh, We have um, Sarah Scott, who is a Hollywood intimacy coordinator. She's going to be talking about consent, learning uh, from her job as an intimacy and sex scene coordinator in Hollywood and how she can bring that information she learned to people and their relationships to have safe sexual relationships. So that's going to be powerful. We have Dr. Warner, who is a forensic psychologist and an expert in male trauma. And I'm going to be there. I'm going to be talking about cults hidden in plain sight. And let me see. I feel like I'm missing somebody. Oh, yes. Uh, Noemi Uebe, she is actually a survivor who was featured on the Hillsong documentary that came out on Discovery Plus. And she is also going to be involved in a major podcast around the Hillsong Church and all of the fallout there. She's a survivor and she's going to be talking to us about her experience and what she's learned 
it's going to be so, so powerful. And then to wrap it all up on our last day, we're actually going to be having spouses of survivors do a full on panel discussion about supporting their spouses who've experienced trauma. And Lyria's husband is actually going to be on the panel, my husband as well, and several others. You are not going to want to miss this. Again, it's totally free, like free is the best price. And all you have to do to sign up is to join our Facebook group or head on over to our landing page where you can find the details about the speakers and the link to our group. Um, just go to courage365.org slash the word 30. That's courage365.org slash the word 30. You are not going to want to miss it. In addition to the speakers and panels, there's going to be self-care challenges and prizes that you can win. So many amazing things going to be happening in the month of October, totally and completely free. Just go to courage365 slash 30. All right. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Please be sure to share this episode and as always live with courage.